So now we're going to take a look at another couple topics associated with power quality, and that's voltage sag due to motor startup and also harmonics. So we'll break things down as follows. We'll, we'll get into the voltage sag due to motor startup first. And be, before we get into that, we have to have a model for an induction motor. And then based on that induction motor model, then we'll do various types of sag calculations. And I'll show you how we could set this up in windmill. And then also for the harmonics, I wanna just kind of give you a kind of an overview of where harmonics come from and what the impact could be. And then we can talk about, you know, different ways harmonics can propagate through distribution circuits. Uh, finally, we'll talk about different types of harmonic limits and we'll do some sample calculations involving harmonics. So the way I'll break this down into three different video parts is I'll start with the, the motor start calculations first, and I'll do one example. And then in the second video, I'll do a second example. And then I want to do a, another computer simulation on, on a, show you a computer simulation for us, how we get the duration of the SAG. You're not responsible for this, but you may need to do something like this in the future and there are computer codes for doing this and then i'll jump into the harmonics at the end of the second segment and then the last segment will just get into harmonic propagation and, I, and i'll show you a numerical example so when we're talking about motor startup what we're referring to is um, the issues associated with large induction motors induction motors are kind of the industry workhorse Synchronous machines are more used for generation, but induction motors are more used for, for loads. And so the issue we run into is that these machines can draw large amounts of current when they start up. And mostly what they're drawing is they're drawing reactive current because when they're starting up, they're not really pulling that much real current. It's mostly they're pulling reactive current. And so if you're a distribution planner, you want to make sure that if you have an industrial customer that has a direct line connected motor turning on and off, that this isn't going to have any adverse impact on other customers on, on the same set of distribution feeders. So this shows a, a kind of a small 100 horsepower motor. Um, this would be a very typical machine design. And then basically this just kind of scales up in size when you get into like 1,000 horsepower or 10,000 horsepower class machines. So I'm assuming that most all of you have seen something on induction motors before. I'm not going to be going through things from first principles on this. But basically, if you look at the bottom of the screen, I've got a cutaway of an induction motor. And what you have is you have a three-phase stator. Those are the windings on the stationary part of the machine. And so if you have this set of windings on the stator three phase, what this is going to do, this is going to create a rotating magnetic field, which is going to travel at a synchronous speed. And exactly what the speed would be, would be dependent on the number of poles in the machine. But anyway, you're going to set this rotating field up in the air gap in the machine. Now, the rotor itself, a lot of times is not directly connected to the outside world. A lot of times you have what's called a scroll cage winding where there's no connections to the rotor. And so if we're gonna get currents induced on the rotor circuit, then this has to be through induction. So it acts like a transformer in a way where you can think about the stators being the primary windings and the rotors being the secondary windings. And in order for you to have currents and voltages induced on that rotor, there has to be a difference in speed between the rotor rotating and mechanical speed and the, and the synchronous speed. So this relationship is given by what's called the slip. And the slip S is going to be the synchronous speed minus the mechanical speed. And this is going to be divided through or normalized by the synchronous speed. And so it's not possible to have induction motor operation in steady state for anything useful and basically have the rotor traveling at the same speed as a synchronous um, synchronous speed associated with the, the stator circuit. There has to be some speed differential. Normally when you see machine operations operating in, 
machines operating in steady state, this is going to be maybe about 0 0.03. And then once you have this term for the slip, then you, you can get the frequencies on the rotor circuit where this is going to be the slip multiplied by the electrical frequency associated with the, with the state. As far as the model for this machine, the, the model is very, very similar to a transformer. We've got a model for the stator, we've got a model for the rotor, we've got a model for the, uh, the magnetizing reactants needed XM, uh, we got a model for core loss. But you'll know what's different in this case is that the resistive part of the circuit on the right, which is given by R2 over S. Basically what this represents, this represents the amount of power that's going to the mechanical load hooked up to the motor. And so again, this is a slip term that we talked about before. Normally when it's operating in steady state, this slip's gonna be really small about 0 0.03 and which what that would mean is that this resistance is rather large. This resistance kind of dominates the whole impedance in here. However, if we're starting the machine up, if we're starting the machine up from standstill, then this mechanical speed when we start the machine up is simply gonna be zero. And what we have is we have a slip equal to one. And if you have a slip equal to one, this resistance in the machine is gonna be relatively small. And so what this is gonna give us, this is gonna give us a large amount of current flowing into this device right here um, at these starting speeds it, it, for these slips equal to one. And this is really what we're concerned about is we're concerned what's gonna be happening when the machine first starts up. These are the equations for the developed torque and this is gonna be a function of some Thevenin equivalent resistance and, and voltage for the machine. It's not really important for you to, to know this because at this point we're not doing any torque speed calculations. But the thing I wanna point out that if you look at this curve relationship for this device right here, we're gonna get a relationship between the speed of the machine and the torque, which looks something like this. And so we're slip 0 0.03, we're gonna be somewhere maybe around the maximum torque somewhere. But when we start this machine up, the torque, the torque is not at maximum by any means, which is why it takes a while for these machines to start up. And so we, we don't get maximum torque at startup, which is why these things could stay in a kind of a low speed condition until the, the rotor finally accelerates. So what we wanna look at in this case is we wanna look at voltage sag that's due to the large amount of current created during motor startup. And we sometimes refer to the startup current as locked rotor current because if, the slip's equal to one and the machine's not moving. It's almost like we got the rotor, something's holding the rotor locked in place. And so if you were gonna measure that current, then that's what's also referred to as the locked rotor current. And this locked rotor current's gonna be much larger than the current we would draw under normal operating conditions, maybe like a factor of five or six. And because we're pulling so much current, then this is gonna give us drops across our system theft and impedance which is gonna cause a large amount of voltage sag, kind of similar to what we saw for a fault. So the current levels are not the same as a fault, but they're high enough, which they would be of a concern. So it's, it's kind of similar to a short circuit analysis, but instead of having like a zero impedance at the point of the fault, we're gonna be putting in a model for the customer transformer and the, in the, the lock rotor impedance for the machine. And so we'll use that to kind of calculate the current. So very similar to a, a, a fault cause sag, but we would have a larger impedance. So again, what we're gonna make use of is we make use of an equivalent model of the utility circuit, very similar to what we saw for short circuit analysis is which why we talk about these two topics together in the same set of lectures. So this is the kind of the simplified model that we're gonna use for our analysis, where we're gonna model the machine by a lock rotor impedance, by a static impedance. The network or what the machine sees, we're gonna 
we're going to model that by a Thevenin equivalent circuit. And so when you complete the circuit path, and what you have is you have the, the starting current in this case. Okay, so this is a starting current that we want to be able to calculate. Now, I want to point out there's other methods for doing short circuit calculations. There's other methods like a constant KVA method you could use as well. But I, I think given that we've already covered short circuits, that it would be easier to use this methodology because this, this would line up with analysis you're are already using. And this would line up more with the impedance model that's used in programs like windmill. So what we need is we need a way of calculating this lock rotor impedance. And a, a simple way of getting this um, particular number right here would be assume this is all reactive. In other words, assume that resistance is rather small and it's mostly X we're looking to calculate. And so we assume it's all reactive. So this is going to be of the form JX, where X is simply going to be the rate of line voltage divided by square root of three. Okay, so this is the line of neutral voltage divided by this locked rotor current. That's normally what we use as the assumption here, assuming that the resistance is going to be small. Now, a lot of times we're going to want to do these calculations per unit. And so what we would need to do is we would need to take this number here and we need to divide through by the impedance base. And that would be the impedance base associated with the machine. So that would be the, the rated line current divided by square root of three divided by the rated full load current. This is sometimes abbreviated as FLA. So this is a per unit value. And what you'll note in this case is that the rated line voltage and the square root of three cancel. And so this lock rotor impedance, if we assume this is all reactive in nature, in per unit on the machine base is going to be J times one over lock rotor current divided by full load current. All right. So again, keep in mind this is on the motor base. And so we may need to do a change of base formula if we're using a different base impedance for our calculations. Now, Sometimes not all this data is available to you. You may not be giving, be given a value of lock road or current. You may have to find other ways of getting that number. And so if we were going to do this accurately, if we're going to talk about the KVA that's consumed from the electrical side of the system from the motor when it's operating, you know, what we, what we could do is we could take the horsepower multiply it by 746 because there's 746 um, watts per horsepower. That's the conversion between electrical and mechanical power. Um, horsepower is a mechanical power term. And so if I, I take that 746, I'm converting that horsepower into watts. And this is the output power. Okay, this is the output power P out. What I need to do is I need to get an input term. I need to get S in. And so to get S in, what I'm doing is I take P out, I divide through by efficiency, that gives me P in, and I divide through by power factor, and that gives me S in. And so this is the formula we could use to get the KVA going to the machine from the electrical side of the circuit. Now, once I've got this, then if I divide through by square root of three times the rate of line voltage, this gives me the full load current. And then to get this lock rotor current, if it's not told to me, then there's ways I can come up with this factor. Normally it's like about five to multiply this by the full load current in order to get this lock rotor current. Now let's suppose that I did not give you efficiency and power factor, then what would you do? Well, as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, that there's about one kVA of electrical input corresponding to about one horsepower of mechanical output. All right. So you could basically equate one kVA to one horsepower. So if you had uh, a thousand horsepower machine, you'd have a thousand kVA input. The other would be if you're not told otherwise, basically assume that start current is going to be maybe between five and six times full load current. And we'll see later on, depending on what we call the NEMA class of the machine, that there's some numbers available for you. And then 
the power factor at startups usually going to be really small, so small that you could usually assume this is all reactive. If we're talking about motors under horsepower, this is going to be about two. If this is really for really big machines over a thousand horsepower. This is going to be about 0.15. So what this usually means is we can model this all as reactive impedance term and just kind of neglect the resistance. So the other thing you have as a piece of information is the starting KVE according to various NEMA machine types. Uh, NEMA is a, tr a trade organization for equipment manufacturers because they have different codes depending on the how the induction machine is built and what it's built for. And what you'll see is depending on the code type, then you would have a lock rotor KVA per horsepower. So then what you can do is you can actually get this input KVA directly as a functional horsepower just simply by um, using this factor right here. So in the end then what we're gonna be using for our calculations is this model. You know, before we talked about how do we get this lock rotor impedance. The other things that are important to calculate this motor current is what are the other terms involved in the thermal impedance for the circuit? So you're gonna have the local transformer that's supplying the motor. You'll have an impedance that's gonna be due to the feeder from the substation bus to the customer site where the transformer's at. That's why I'm modeling a Z line default. I know there's not a fault there, but I'm just keeping the terminology from the short circuit analysis. You have a model for the system I'm calling the substation impedance, but this is a substation transformer plus the transmission system. And a lot of times we're interested in what is this voltage at a point of common coupling with respect to other feeders hooked up to the same substation. And so if I had a sensitive customer over here, then I would be wanting to know, well, to what degree is this voltage gonna sag due to a motor start on an adjacent feeder? So very similar again to the fault, but instead of putting a zero impedance here, I'm going to have a larger impedance due to the transformer and the lock rotor impedance of the motor. We'll see later on why this is so important to model the transformer, because that transformer has a lot of series impedance, especially uh, compared to the, the feeder impedance. So really that it's really, really important to model that transformer impedance properly. The other thing we're going to be doing in these calculations is we're going to tend to want to use per unit here because we, we would have a transformation at the substation and transformation at the customer. It becomes kind of awkward to go through two transformations and work this in terms of volts and amps. And so in the cases I'm going to be showing you, I'm going to be converting everything over to per unit. So this would be another equivalent view in this case. Um, basically, Again, here's two parallel feeders. I've got the substation, I've got the line, I've got bus two where the motor starting up is gonna be at. And then what I would be interested with, uh, in finding out is to what degree would a, a customer on the same feeder be affected and what degree would a customer on adjacent feeder be affected. As far as mitigation strategies for this, as far as what we can do about it, there's a number of things we could do. First is we have to reduce the startup current somehow. The way we can do this, we can simply put a series impedance between the motor and the rest of the circuit. Basically, we're going to cause less current to flow if I put in a series impedance. Now, there's what's called starting boxes, which do this. But the thing you have to watch out for is if you put a series impedance in there and it draws less current, there's less starting torque. So it takes longer to start up worse, it may stall and just not even start up, right? So there's what's called a starting box. The other thing is you could use with an auto transform or some other voltage reducing device to temporarily reduce the voltage. So this reduces the starting current, but again, it also reduces the starting torque. So reduce voltage is another thing. Um, you'll see power electronic devices that feed motors have what's called soft starts. And so what they do is they temporarily lower the voltage to lower the starting current. And then the other thing you could do is you could try to supply the reactive current locally 
by putting like a capacitor in parallel with the motor so you're not drawing it from the grid. Uh, or you can use some other power electronic device locally that would supply the reactive power as well. So this would be kind of a, the conventional method, but you have what are referred to these VAR compensation units that could supply reactive power locally so you get less voltage drop across the system. So for the example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a, a grid uh, supplies 12.47 kV. It has a, a substation equivalent impedance of 8% per unit on a 20 MVA base. And so this is a 20 MVA substation with the XR ratio of six. For the line lengths, I'm going to have two line lengths in here, one of 336, another one odd. And then um, we'll have these values in a table that follows. And then for the customer where the motor's at, We'll assume it's a thousand horsepower machine with efficiency of 92%, power factor 80%, and a locked rotor KVA to horsepower of 5 to 1. And so we need one more piece of information, which is the transformer impedance. And we'll assume the transformer is converting to 480. This is a very common industrial voltage. It's a 3 MVA transformer. Uh, percent Z equal to six and an XR ratio of five to one. And again, as a sanity check, if I have a thousand horsepower machine and I've got a thousand KVA, um, uh, sorry, I should say thousand um, volt amperes per horsepower, then I, I can see here I'm going to have about a about thousand KVA or one MVA during normal conditions. So as a sanity check, we just want to make sure that that's not going to overload the transformer. And so I'm going to calculate the lock road of current and I want to calculate a voltage sag term. And so what I'm looking for in this case, and here's the, the values I'm going to use for the transformer impedances. And this is all balanced analysis. So these are all positive sequence values. But what I'm looking at is I'm looking at what's kind of going on here at the, um, at the customer upstream and I'm looking also what's happening at the customer downstream where they have the motor at. So when this motor starts, it's going to draw a huge amount of current in this path. So this is going to be like the locked road of current. And I want to know to what degree that customer with that monitor A is going to be seen. So first I do is I come up with my motor model. And here I've got all the information I gave it to you. So I can calculate, well, what's the rated motor KVA? And so horsepower times 746 to convert this to watts, um, divide by efficiency to get PN, divide by power factor to get SN, and this is going to be 1,013.6. Very, very close to having 1,000 KVA corresponding to 1,000 horsepower. The locked rotor value is five times the horsepower, and so the locked rotor KVA is going to be 5,000. And so what I can do is I can make use of this formula for getting lock rotor impedance. This is going to be J times 1 over LRA over FLA. And note what I'm doing in here is I'm plugging in the KVA numbers directly because all I would really be doing in this case to convert to amps is just simply dividing through by square root of 3 times 480. So if you wanted to do that, you can do that. But I know the square root of 3 times 480s are going to cancel out. And so another thing you could do is, I know this is current, but you can actually substitute in in terms of volt amperes and get the same thing. And so in this case, what I see is I see the locked rotor impedance in per unit is 0.2, very typical value. But this is on the motor base. And so when I do the calculations, I'm going to go ahead and do these calculations using the system base of 20 MVA. And so what I need to do is I need to use what's called a change of base formula, or what I do is I take the value in one base, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be multiplying by the new base over the old base. Okay, so system base is is S base new, motor base is S base old, 
And so when you're transforming the impedance, so I could use this on a 20 MVA base instead of on the motor base, then I, I need to multiply by S base new over S base old. And this gives me a value of J4 per unit ohms that's going to be on this 20 MVA base. So for the substation model, I've, I've, I know that this impedance in per unit is 8% or 0.08. I've got an X to R ratio of six. And so I can use this to substitute in for the resistance. I can solve for the reactance. Once I have the reactance, I can solve for the resistance. And I've got this value here in per unit where this value is already on the 20 MB base. So I don't have to do any change of base formula. Now, when I come over to the transformer, then the transformer impedance is obtained the same way as a substation, but this is on the three MVA base. And so I have to multiply by the new base over the old base. So the new base is 20 MVA, 20 to about over three. And this is gonna give me this value for the transformer on the new base. And so this is something we haven't had to do before, but this is something you need to do if you're trying to work this in per unit is you got to make sure that all the per unit impedances are on the same base system. And then for the feeder impedance, I can calculate Z base. Again, I'm using 20 here. And what I'm doing is I've got these two line lengths, one mile each. I have to divide both these by impedance base. And this gives me the values for the line impedances in per unit. And so basically those two impedances put together is a sum total of the feeder impedance I need to consider for the motor start. So when I do the locked rotor calculation, basically what I've got is I've got a series path through the substation impedance, through this first section impedance, through the second line section of impedance, through the transformer impedance, through the locked rotor impedance of the motor. And so this is going to give me the current, which is going to be the substation voltage divided by the sum of all these impedances. For lack of anything better, I'm just going to go ahead and assume that I've got one per unit at the substation. So if you're not told otherwise, you just go ahead and assume one per unit. And what I'm going to then do is I'm going to take one per unit over the summation right here. And this is going to give me uh, 0 0.2151 at an angle of minus 87 degrees per unit, all right? So what I've got in this case, yeah, I got this on pen already. Uh, what I've got in this case is um, I've got this locked rotor current. And what I need to do if I want the actual value at the customer site, then what I need to do is I need to multiply this 0.215 magnitude times um, the, um, base current, which is 20 MVA divided by square root of three times 480. I want this particular lock rotor current on the 480 volt side of the circuit. All right, so I'm kind of get, I'm trying to get set up where um, I'm gonna do this particular calculation. And so this term right here, this term right here is the base current. So make sure that you don't do this base current calculation on the wrong side of the transformer. Make sure that I divide through by 480 so I get the base current on the customer side. And it's a pretty decent size current. It's like 5,174 amps when this starts up. So when these things start up, draw a huge amount of current. Now, there's a number of different ways we could calculate that, um, that voltage. But one way I'm going to do this in this particular case is I'm going to take the substation value, um, which is Z sub, and I'm going, to, I'm going to subtract off the voltage drop across the combination of the substation impedance and that feeder impedance from the substation to where that customer A is at. Okay, so that's what I'm going to call Z sub P2. And so what I have in this case is I've got um, this one um, minus this drop across here. Uh, I'm not showing the breakdowns. I'm, I'm not showing this as Z times I. I've got the final numbers in here in this case. 
And you can see this voltage is 0.9, has a magnitude of 0.965. So if you wanted this in terms of actual value at that customer, in terms of what a monitoring system would see, you can multiply by the line to neutral voltage base, um, which is 40 divided by square root of three. And what we see is we have a voltage 200, 267.5 volts. So basically the sag in this case, the sag in this case from nominal is only 3.5. 5%, not really, not really too bad. Um, one of the reasons why this isn't too bad is that this customer A is pretty close to the substation. The system's pretty stiff. And so there's not a huge amount of voltage drop. And the other thing that's happening too, is if you look at what's basically the series, net series impedance, Basically, what you see is this transformer adds a pretty decent amount of impedance in here as well, right? And so this is a pretty stiff system. You know, you got, you got a 20 MVA system, which is pretty big. And basically, you have a device here, which is drawing, you know, when it starts up like 5,000 amps. If, if you might think that's a big value, but 20 MVA is a pretty strong source in this case. And what that does is it keeps the voltage tag from dropping too low. If this had been like a 5 MVA source, though, this would have been a lot worse. And so anyway, this just shows a typical calculation. And what you'd be looking at in this case is could that customer at location A, uh, would they be OK with a 3.5% sag? That's kind of getting on the edge of what you'd want the sag to be at. Um, you know, probably 3% would probably be a better number in that case. And, and it kind of depends how often this motor starts up. If it was like an amusement park there and hooked up to some ride and this was happening over and over and over and over again, yeah, that might be an issue. But if it's just motors just starting once in a while, maybe that wouldn't be so bad. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. And when I come back, then I'll go through this second example then.